Good evening, everyone. How are we doing? Doing all right? I can tell some of you are back row, back row in college. If I didn't sit in the front row, I was in deep trouble in college. When I started calculating how much I was spending for the class that I was in, it helped me move forward a little bit. So it also helped that I had like four classes my freshman year with Lisa. So they got me to actually go to class, which was awesome as well, at the great Biola University. Well, welcome. Thank you for being here tonight. It really is a privilege just to hear from a man who has done significant amount of work and significant amount of just time in ministry, significant amount of work in writing, significant even today being on a all-day Zoom call with people across the country, right, and just having different viewpoints and and just engaging with people. I think he has a, a great sound voice for how we engage with people, which really is, I think, the most important part of absolutely to have convictions, absolutely. But if we're not able to actually talk with people, we have conviction without any compassion at all. So it really is a privilege to have Dr. Langer with us here um, tonight. He's going to lecture, teach, Share, whatever it is that you call this, you're a doctor, so it's like lecture. I give speeches. That's what I hear. Kids, okay, that was a nice speech. I'm like, awesome. That's what I do. So he's going to come on up afterwards. We'll have a time of question and answer. If you weren't here on Sunday, um, I just want to make sure that you know this. He has been a theology professor by the university and undergraduate and postgraduate levels. He's the co-founder of the Winsome Conviction which is a project launched from a heartfelt concern for the toxic, polarized, and simply unloving communication climate that is permeating our nation and penetrating the body of Christ. He has written books, taught courses, hosted podcasts, and we just are really excited to have him here again tonight. He's here on Sunday. He'll be here again on this upcoming Sunday. So just welcome with me Dr. Rick Langer. Come on up. Thank you, Dale, and thank all you guys for coming out on a Wednesday night. Um, I have had a great time in Los Gatos. You guys have one cool city here. I uh, have enjoyed the trails along the creek, the mountains, the restaurants, the uh, pine trees and the oak trees and all kinds of uh, things like that. So uh, it has been really, really fun for me to be able to be here. Uh, on Sunday, I talked a little bit about the issue of um, kind of our, our spiritual side relative to conflicts and tensions we have that are kind of raised by politics. I, I talked about the issue of fear and right-sizing our fears and right-sizing our God. Uh, next Sunday, I'll be here again, and I'll talk a little bit about some things related to our own kind of souls in terms of how we communicate with others. So the, I'm doing a lot of things about kind of our spiritual life on Sunday mornings. That was pretty revolutionary. I thought I'd just try that out and see how that works. I mean, who would have thought of that, right? Um, tonight, what I'd like to do is do a little bit of a deeper dive into the nature of Christian convictions themselves. And I'm not going to spend time answering uh, who you should vote for and why, or exegeting a, you know, a Harris vote or a Trump vote, however I do those sums. Anyhow, I, that isn't my goal as much as saying, how do you think that through? Um, because I'm worried that we haven't done a good job of understanding even our own convictions. And so I want to, th that is what I've spent a lot of time actually thinking about. Uh, I, I spend time worrying about my own convictions, and I do process that through to particular conclusions, but uh, I'm a huge fan of saying we need to have better formed convictions, and so that's what I really want to take some time to talk about, and as Dale mentioned, we'll take, you know, probably the next 50 minutes or so, and I will talk about some of that, and then we'll have, we should have a good chunk of time for, for Q&A, and I'm happy to do, uh, you know, engage with whatever comes up, um, and as long as Dale's here, if they're too bad, I'll just throw them to him, and we'll be good. All right, um, let's see, look at that, there we go. So Christian convictions, uh, as I note here, you probably don't need the newsflash, but we live in an increasingly angry culture. Uh, we, 
we uh, commonly, my friend and I, uh, Tim, my, the co-founder of the Winston Conviction Project, and I, he, he's a communication scholar and he talks about um, uh, Tannen, Deborah Tannen was a Georgetown scholar who was describing uh, modern American discourse and says, we live in the argument culture. Everything comes in argument. Do you know when she said that? It was in 1999. And I look back at the 1990s like with nostalgia. I mean, we may not have been fans of, uh, you know, Clinton or Bush or whoever it was that might have been president, wherever you happen to land on those things. But there was kind of a, a normalness, it seems, in retrospect to our discourse that nowadays I'm like, if that was the argument culture, what is this? The combat culture, the anger culture, I don't even know what words to describe it. But I was looking at a study that uh, I found particularly interesting, and it poses for us an interesting challenge, which is part of why I wanted to, to dig into this. You probably can't read that. I can't read it if I look that way, so I'm going to turn around backwards and I will read what this is. But it's a survey where they ask people um, how they view people on the other party. Are they a lot or somewhat fill in the blank compared to the rest of America? So are Democrats more fill in the blank than uh, your party is if you're a Republican and vice versa? So it's Republicans rating Democrats, Democrats rating Republicans, and are you more this way? So here were the things that they rated on. Number one was close-minded. If you lean right, are the people on the left more closed-minded than others? Uh, and the, the numbers here begin with 2016 and move to 2022. So these, this is a very narrow period of time for demographic shifts. The six-year period isn't the time you normally see these kinds of jumps. But basically, closed-mindedness goes like for uh, Republicans that say Democrats are closed-minded have gone from 52% to 69%. Dishonest from 42% to 64%, or 45 to 72, depending upon which of your parties you're in. From 35 to 63, when you say immoral. Um, unintelligent, from 32% up to over 50% for people in both parties. And lazy, um, from 46% to 62%. These are dramatic increases in a relatively short period of time. And here's the rub about this. So a million problems with that, as you can imagine. But here's what really bugs me and, and that makes me worry about this. Um, we're supposed to love our neighbor. We're supposed to speak words of peace. We're supposed to preserve unity. We're supposed to do all these kinds of things. And I look at a chart like that and I say, how do I feel about being gracious, humble, gentle, and kind to people who are closed-minded, lazy, unintelligent, dishonest, and immoral. <laughs> and I, I'm like, that is a spiritual problem for me, right? I don't get to opt out of commands to f practice the fruit of the Spirit, right? But when I suddenly have to do it to a person who I view to be <laughs> closed-minded, lazy, unintelligent, dishonest, and immoral, I'm suddenly like, honestly, I don't want to talk to that person at all. And if I do have to talk to him, I really don't want to talk to him that way in a gracious, kind, humble, loving fashion. And my sense is I'm not alone in that bit of self-reflection about my own heart. And I think that is commonly true of everybody. I, I think it's probably very natural and very human, but there's a part I want to say, part of what Christians do with discipleship is learn to do things that aren't actually natural to us, and that the divine nature sort of becomes our second nature. And if we go with our first nature, we go to places that we don't really want to go as a disciple. So this, I just throw up here, not to give you some news flash, but to try and highlight the fact that this is kind of an important thing for us to deal with. Now, I frame this in the left-right debate, um, and 
we commonly frame that discourse about how we are in the public square. It isn't necessarily a Christian thing, non-Christian thing. It's our, our, public, our, our public discourse. The, the problem is that it isn't just that our public has those perceptions, but by and large, the church has followed down the same tracks. And if you were to look at survey data that marks off religious people, by and large, we are in the same track, sometimes even more exacerbated on some of these things. Um, so it, the worst of that, though, is we're experiencing this not just how we interface with the culture, but within the church itself. So here's an interesting statistic. Where do Christians, this is a Barna survey of Christians, where do you experience unity? About three in five Christians, 61%, report experiencing unity most often in their homes. Well, that's probably a good thing. 48%, they say they experience with their friendships. Only slightly over one in three say that they find and experience unity within their church. And you think of Jesus' words, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. And then we self-report our experience in the church and only about a 30 of us are finding an experience of unity. And I'm going, ah, uh, we're becoming like the culture. And that's kind of scary. Here's another one. March of 2022, 42% of pastors have considered quitting full-time ministry within the past year. That's up 13 percentage points from about one year earlier. Of those considering quitting, 43% cite feelings of loneliness and isolation, and 38% cite the current political divisions as the reason they're considering stepping away from ministry. That's almost 40% of pastors who are thinking about stepping away from ministry because of the polarization that they're experiencing related to politics, but within the church. In other words, and it isn't church politics, it's the political divisiveness that's manifesting itself within, within the church. Um, wow. I don't know what happened to that font, but trust me, I can actually read it from here, so take it by faith, this is what it says. Um, we spend our strength in arguing, bickering, contending, quarreling, and opposing one another rather than magnifying, blessing, and praising the name of God. We are divided people. Peace and unity have flown from us, and a spirit of contention and division has come upon us. The church is divided, the state is divided, the city is divided, the country is divided, families are divided, godly people are divided, ministers almost everywhere are divided. Yes, indeed, what heart is there at this time that is not divided within itself? What a great descriptive quote of modern America, right? Except it was said by Jeremiah Burroughs, the English Puritan, in 1646. And that should give you pause for thought about how deep these problems go within the church and how long they have been part of us. And I am not saying this to distribute guilt. <laughs> I'm saying, guys, we need to be honest about how threatening this is to the health of the body of Christ and how hard it is for everybody to manage. It seems in every generation, we have times when it's been worse, we had times when it's been better, but it is not at all uncommon for us to have these struggles. And we should take them as a serious matter of spiritual formation and Christian growth. To say, how do I deal with people who have profound differences from what I do when it comes to matters of conviction about, you know, social, political, and indeed religious issues too. Um, the other thing that hit me when I was first thinking about this is that Christians obviously have a problem with this, and I began to think about this with conviction. As I was, we actually have a particularly bad problem with convictions legitimately. In other words, we have a reason for having a more problematic way of dealing with convictions, and, and that's this. Um, there's a couple of unique fe features about Christian convictions that tend to intensify our disagreements. Number one, we don't form our convictions in order to please ourselves. We form our convictions in order to please Jesus, right? If someone is asking you, what do you feel about abortion? What do you feel about immigration? What do you feel about who you should vote for? Whatever it might be, 
My hope is as a Christian, your first concern is say, well, what do I think would be pleasing to Jesus? And that's what I want to do. If I like it or don't like it, that's kind of a secondary issue. I've never been particularly fond of the doctrine of hell. I mean, if, if I had to think up a way to end everything, I probably wouldn't have done that. That, that really doesn't matter to me, right? I don't care if I like it or not. It's like, it's there. I, I have to sign off on that, right? And I feel that about an awful lot of things that I do. I, it doesn't matter to me that much about what I happen to feel. I spend my time first worrying about what I believe Jesus feels about this, and then I want to align myself with him. Great. So what happens if you're sitting behind, beside somebody in a Bible study who has the opposite viewpoint on some particular issue? You suddenly realize we don't just disagree, I disagree with you. It's like the two of you are disagreeing about who Jesus is and what Jesus values. And this other person is telling you, in effect, Rick, you got Jesus wrong. And it's one thing for someone to tell me I'm wrong. I mean, for heaven's sakes, I've lived with I'm wrong for 67 years. I'm used to that. Well, when you tell me you got Jesus wrong, that's kind of a big deal, and you can feel it upping the ante on the controversy, and that's only part one of this. Part two is that we form our convictions because they're grounded in absolutes, not personal opinions or the things that we happen to have read. So in the non-Christian world, I spend a lot of time interacting with people in the non-Christian world, and it's very common for people to cite books and authors and experiences and things like that that got them to the convictions they happen to hold. In the Christian world, we tend to cite Scripture. We care what the Bible says about something, not what Malcolm Gladwell says about something, so to speak, or, you know, whoever your favorite author might be. Uh, so I say, yeah, this is my conviction about abortion. You have a different viewpoint. I say this is about immigration, whatever these things are. But in all cases, we're saying we're appealing to Scripture. And once again, you see this weird thing happen. When we disagree, you're not just saying, oh, you read Jonathan Haidt, I read Malcolm Gladwell, and we end up disagreeing. It's like, no, no, we read the same Bible, and you got it wrong, Rick. We have a name for people who teach the wrong things about the Bible. We call them false prophets. We have a thing we do to false prophets. We call it stone them. And at some point, you're like, wow, those are like, fighting words, and they're born of the way we form our convictions, right? In other words, we're not doing something wrong when we say, I want to please Jesus. We're not doing something wrong when I want to appeal to Scripture, but that means when we disagree with each other, the disagreement is amped up. And the final one I put up here is uh, our convictions, we understand our convictions and our kind of social practices to be grounded in what's called the great antithesis. This is a phrase I think that well, certainly was used by Abraham Kuyper. I think he might have coined it. But it's kind of the great battle of the ages between Satan and God, and he's basically, you, you take sides in that, right? You're on God's side versus Satan's side. Um, and the, so we're not simply in a, in a culture war or I'm left, you're right. We're in this thing about, so I'm wanting to line up with God in the kingdom of God against Satan in the kingdom of Satan. That's what I feel like I'm called to do. Once again, you have this weird feeling if you're feeling this is really what the kingdom of God would ask us to do, and the person sitting beside in your Bible study, you're about to pray and hold hands to close the Bible study time, suddenly articulates this viewpoint that feels like it's on the opposite side. And in an actual war, not a metaphorical one, if the person on the other side is caught behind enemy lines, wearing their enemy garb. In other words, if you're, you know, the blues and the green, grays and the gray soldiers behind your enemy lines and you find him there dressed in gray, that person becomes a, a prisoner of war and you put them in a the prisoner of war camp until the war's over and then you send them back home. But if that person from the other side is wearing your uniform, they are a spy and spies can be shot in the morning. 
And it feels often like if someone that we perceive as from the other side shows up in your church, it's like you have a spy from the other side behind enemy lines. And that elevates the tension as well. So when Christians disagree with one another about convictions, we have pretty big problems that arise and they're absolutized very quickly because of what I pointed out, I think are good reasons, right? The, there's nothing that anyone's doing that I've described here that I would disagree with. By all means, you're caught in, in the big war, beyond God's side and the kingdom of God's side. By all means, read scripture and, and form your convictions that way. By all means, seek to please Jesus, not yourself. But when you disagree, suddenly that becomes very, very difficult to preserve unity, uh, preserve peace and the unity of the spirit. So that's what keeps me awake at night. When I think about my, my own self, and I, I will be honest, I don't do this because I've got it all figured out. I do this because I'm really worried that it's hard to figure this out and I wanna do whatever I can to help. But I feel every one of these tensions my, myself. So let me do a little deeper dive into convictions. And the one thing I do want to say, one of the things that people do, by the time I'm done giving this description, people say, okay, how do we fix that? I know we'll get rid of convictions. And I'm like, that's exactly the thing we can't do because our convictions are what operationalize our faith. Our faith is merely intellectual until we take our beliefs and turn them into action-guiding convictions turn them into things we actually do. So the one thing we can't do is get rid of our convictions. The other thing I've noticed is that people, well, let me add one more thought to this then. In light of that, since we can't get rid of the convictions, the thing that we need to do is say, how do we work with them? And here's my one keen insight on this issue. And that is, I don't think deeply held convictions cause conflict. I think poorly formed convictions cause conflict. And when you have a deeply held conviction, but it's well formed, you've thought about it, and somebody sees things differently, you don't respond necessarily with fear or anger because you've thought through this thing. And you might be completely unperturbed by the things that they've said. You might say, I've never thought of that. But the point is you have thought about your conviction and if this person has prodded you to think more, you're going back to familiar territory. So that's right. When I started this out, I had 10 questions about this. I've answered those 10 and this guy just gave me 11. Well, I guess I better get to work. And you can relax a little bit in the face of the opposition or the tension. If your conviction is, I'll be careful how I say this, I'm not gonna say half baked, but half cooked, you get really queasy when somebody shakes it up. You're afraid that you, maybe you're wrong or all those other things, and you get kind of the animal fear reaction back out of a person. They feel threatened about that conviction, and that tends to lead to bad and toxic discourse, and that often leads to divisiveness. So I'm a huge fan of saying the best way to preserve convictions and also preserve peace and unity is to make sure we've cultivated well-formed convictions, we understand what goes into them, and we have accurate expectations about what we should expect convictions to be like within the body of Christ. And so that's what I wanna take some time to work on in the next few minutes here. So a little bit of a deeper dive into convictions. Let me first just say, when it comes to issues about civility and the way we communicate with others, I wanna say that civility should be a matter of conviction. <laughs> We don't get to opt out or saying, well, hey, because you're wrong, I get to be uncivil. I'm saying, no, no, we need to form convictions about being civil, gracious, loving, and kind in this. Um, let me just grab the, the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit. Um, the works of the flesh are enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, and envy. We have a little bit about worshiping false gods at the beginning of that little series, and we have a tiny bit about sexual immorality thrown in. But of the, I think, 13 or 14 things that are listed as the uh, works of the flesh, 
I think eight of them are given to you right there. And they're about us quarreling and fighting with each other. Those are things that are the works of the flesh. The works of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, on the other hand, is peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And you can almost feel immediately the difference between these two things. And at some point you want to say, back to that great antithesis, am I on the side of the kingdom of God or the side of Satan? Look at what this passage is telling you. These are the works of the flesh. These are the works in effect of Satan, the fruit of Satan working in your life. Uh, we don't want to have contention and anger unless Satan gain a foothold. This is a language that Paul commonly uses. James uses this as well. We'll look a little bit at some of this on next Sunday. So we need to get pretty strong conviction about saying these are places as divisiveness, envy, jealousness, places that we can't go. Um, here's another good example of this. The Westminster Catechism, I imagine you uh, whether or not you're familiar with the catechism, I don't know, you've probably heard the phrase. And this is one of the most influential Christian creeds that came out of the Reformation era. And uh, the, the Westminster Confession itself has a whole set of questions with it. And then the catechism unpacks these questions. Uh, they have, I can't remember how many questions, there's a larger and a sh shorter and a, a longer one. Um, but the catechism is enormously long and detailed, and it's actually a brilliant document. There's a huge amount of wonderful theology in there. But one of the things they also include after the confession is the Ten Commandments, because they feel those are things that should guide our, our thinking. So you, you include the Ten Commandments in this confession, but here's the catechism, the teaching that goes with it, particularly relative to the Ninth Commandment. Um, regarding not bearing false witness. Um, what are the duties required by the ninth commandment? Here's the list, among other things. Preserving and promoting of truth and the good name of our neighbor as well as our own. Second thing, speaking the truth and only the truth in all matters of judgment and justice. Third, a charitable esteem for our neighbors loving, desiring, and rejoicing in their good name and sorrowing for and covering their infirmities. And then finally, freely acknowledging their gifts and graces, ready to receive a good report and an unwillingness to admit of an evil report concerning them. Doesn't that sound like social media? I, I mean, I, I look at that list and I think of our, our Facebook posts. Um, we had a, one of our professors did a thing back in COVID when the vaccines first came out about loving your neighbor uh, by getting a COVID vaccine because he, he tried to unpack this by saying, look, it isn't just a question of your personal concerns, but also that will make others more able to go back to public worship and help everybody get back to normal. He lists off those kinds of things about, you know, how that contributes to the community. And I read it and I thought, yeah, you know, it didn't seem like an earth-shaking um, line of argument. And I understood there'd be other people who would argue it a different way. Um, Wow. There were 700 Facebook comments posted on these, and I collected them, a batch of them, and edited them down. I don't think you could get a better textbook at how to violate the Ninth Commandment than those Facebook posts. And these were put on Biola's webpage by fellow Christians. And I'm like, do we, I have no problem someone disagreeing, but I understood people saw COVID vaccines in a million different ways. I get all of that. But that kind of discourse, and they realize, oh, we haven't formed a conviction about civil discourse, have we? We haven't formed or we aren't holding to a conviction about how we speak with others. So that's the first thing I want to say is we need to own this as a matter of conviction. Secondly, we need to think a little bit better about how our convictions work. Um, one of the reasons we're prone to fight over convictions is because I think we misunderstand them, and we need to do a deep dive into Romans chapter 14. And in the context of Romans 14, 
Paul is talking about disputable matters. That's how he labels them. And he says, in these disputable matters, you have some things that may be absent. Well, let me just say in general, I think we tend to think of there being two types of things. There's things that you might call matters of taste, and there's things that you call matters of conviction. And matters of taste are things that people will see differently on. And generally speaking, the response to a matter of taste is just like, yeah, you like chocolate, I like vanilla. Um, you like the Broncos, I like the Raiders. I like the Broncos, actually. You might like the Raiders. That, of course, is actually a matter of moral conviction. But anyhow, um, you know, we have all those areas. And like even that, I mean, we really do in Denver hate the Raiders. And I think the Raiders probably hate the Broncos in quotes. But even then, we usually kind of joke about it because we realize it isn't that big a deal. But in matters of absolutes, in matters of conviction, we view these to be the things. These are the things. These are the hills on which we die. Now, the interesting thing that Paul does in Romans 14 is he acknowledges the fact that there's such a thing as matters of mere taste or preference. He says there are things that are absolutes, absolutely. But he says there's another thing out there that you might call matters of personal conviction rather than absolute conviction. So I'm not sure if my animation, yeah, somewhere in the course of swapping things around, we lost our animation. But those boxes down there at the middle, I have absolute convictions, I have matters of taste, and what it's supposed to do is move apart and personal convictions pop up in between these two things. And the interesting thing about this is these areas of personal convictions are, are areas where people can disagree and Paul expects people to disagree. But he also says, I want you to actually form a conviction about them. Because a matter of taste is what you might call beneath conviction. Don't get a conviction about what football team you cheer for. Or in Paul's case, you might say, don't get a conviction about who baptized you or who led you to Christ. Um, don't even get a conviction about which spiritual gift you have. The Holy Spirit distributes to each one individually as well. This is not a thing that you fight about. Um, there's other things that are absolutes in, in Romans 14, right before that is Romans 13. You probably knew that already. But the end of Romans 13, he talks about let the time that has passed be sufficient for a whole set of things, uh, which includes quite a variety of things, including sexual immorality and orgies. So that's a matter of absolutes. Paul says, no, if, if, if the junior high pastor comes to you, Dale, and said, hey, I was talking to the kids, and they want an activity next Friday night. They're wondering if we could have an orgy. It's like, the answer is no. This is not a matter of debate. This is not a disputable matter. This is an absolute. No, we're not doing that, right? So Paul is well aware of these things that are kind of below conviction. He has things that are absolute convictions, but then he says there's a whole set of things that occupy middle ground. And in Romans 14, it, what you might call days and diets. Let me just read uh, his introductory, well, the beginning of this passage. I'd love to go through the whole thing. Uh, this is a whole old message by itself, but we can get the first part here. Romans 14, beginning verse 1. As for the one who's weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions or disputable matters. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person, the person of a weak conscience, believes he can eat only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on him who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It's before his own master he stands or falls, and he will be upheld. Then he goes on to say, one person esteems one day is better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. That's a really interesting passage. Days and diets. Now, the problem with reading this as a 21st century American is when we think of days and diets, we tend to hear that kind of like chocolate or vanilla. You go to church on Saturday night. I go to church on Sunday morning. We can't fight about that. Don't be ridiculous. Okay, I want you to, to enter the time, sh time machine and go backwards 2,000 years to the first century Mediterranean world and ask yourself the question, if you had a 50-50 mixed Jewish-Gentile congregation in that context, how would they feel about days and diets? 
In case you don't have an imagination for that, just think of this. Think of Jesus in the Gospels. What were the number one and two things he got in trouble for? Who he ate with and what day he did his healings on, right? They were the number one sources of conflict, days and diets. Why? Because they were an identity marker for the Jewish people at that time. And when you began messing with that, you began to mess with a whole lot more than just what you happened to do on that day. So when Paul is picking up that, and the, the Roman congregation is exactly a Jewish-Gentile mixed congregation, he's writing to the Romans, and he's saying, look, when it comes to days and diets, these are disputable matters. And in disputable matters, I want you, interestingly enough, in fact, I, I guess... Probably doesn't matter because you can't read it anyhow. I, maybe you can. Um, he says, what I want you to do is form personal convictions. So if you were to go through what I just read there, Romans 13, 14, 3 and 4, it says, do not judge others. They are not your servants. So these are to be personally held. You don't export them. These are not for export. These are for domestic consumption, so to speak. I form a conviction to guide my conduct. But the interesting thing is, says, I don't want you to just say that's a preference because then he says, be fully convinced in your own mind. Um, and then he goes on in verse 12 to say, uh, it doesn't matter if, if your brother judges you on this because you don't answer to your brother. You will answer to Jesus for this thing. And he goes on to say, anything that doesn't proceed from faith is sin. So he's saying this is not a matter of who cares. He's saying you should care and Jesus will care because he will hold you accountable for the convictions that you form. But he won't hold you accountable for your brother's or your sister's convictions. He's going to hold you accountable for yours. So these are personal convictions. And how do you hold them? Well, you hold them in effect with civility. Pursue peace, avoid quarrels. That's basically his rule of thumb in Romans 14. Pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding in verse 19. Don't quarrel over opinions in verse 1. He's saying, guys, you will have areas in which you will form moral convictions, personally held spiritual convictions. Everyone doesn't have to agree on those areas. There are areas of absolutes that you should all agree on. There's areas that you shouldn't form a conviction at all. I don't care who baptized you, but you do need to decide about certain things and how you will practice them. And I want you to form a conviction, and I want you to honor Jesus with that conviction. The whole realm of personal convictions. And I tell you what, that one thought should change everything about your expectations of what happens in any given time when it's a matter of conviction within a church. Is to stop and say, oh. Number one, my hope is your first thought would be, I better figure out if this is a matter of universal absolute conviction or this is a matter where there's room for difference. And never think difference attaches to the trivial, right? Because we've already talked about that. This is not a trivial issue to the people he's writing to, but he's saying there's an area of Christian freedom where people will see and understand this differently. And you have room to do that. And you need to be able to trust the Holy Spirit to work on the other person and to work on you in this, in this realm. So that's what he is laying out there in Romans chapter 14. Um, and if I were to say, I, I've developed in the book that we're on, and I don't have time to do all this tonight, but what we call the conviction spectrum. <laughs> and all we're doing so is convictions don't just form point blank in a place. There's kind of a whole process of things that go into forming a specific conviction that guides you. And this, again, font's probably too small to read easily. But on the left-hand side of this are the set of things that we're assuming all Christians would likely hold in common. And I list those first as basically confessional beliefs and moral mandates, particularly in this case, when I, well, the way to think about a confessional belief is think about the way you do confessions. You guys actually have the generosity creed that you recite. Uh, depending upon your church background, you may have grown up reciting the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed or even Westminster Confession in church. Those are interesting. Most creedal statements read something like this. We believe in God the Father, maker of the heavens and the earth, and in Jesus Christ, 
our Lord, who was conceived by the... And you go on through the statement, and notice what that's prefaced by, the phrase, we believe. You're not saying, I believe. This is a creedal confession, and the operating assumption is all Christians will share that in common. As I already mentioned with the Westminster Confession, they add to that things like the moral mandates, the Ten Commandments are explicitly added to those confessions in that context. And generally speaking, we do think that a Christian just says, well, I know God says thou shalt not commit adultery, but I thought about it and said, no, nah, I think I will. We're just like, you know, you can tell me a story about how you fell to temptation. There's a million things you say, but you say, no, nah, I opted out. Well, we don't feel like you just get to opt out of in a clear and explicit moral mandate, right? These are things that are binding upon us, whether that happens to coincide with our preferences or not. So I'm lumping those two things together. You may, why do you split them? Well, one is a belief, the other is a command. That's all I'm doing. But I'm saying both cases you find those things worded in such a way that they're binding upon the Christian conscience. And these are the things that, like I say, these would be, would be absolutes. But the thing about the absolutes is that by and large these are theological or conceptual. They're timeless truths. But here's the rub. To actually live in our world today, the absolute theological and conceptual needs to be translated into the personal, practical, and temporal expressions. In other words, we have to figure out how to live that out today. I know the command says thou shalt not kill, but what does that mean about capital punishment? What does that mean about serving in the military? What does that mean about just war versus pacifism? Um, we aren't debating whether or not that command is binding on us, but we suddenly realize we've got to implement it in some really interesting, challenging contexts. We've got to get down and answer those questions. We'll be confronted by those issues, right? And to say abstractly, yeah, well, I believe in, you know, that we shouldn't kill, it's like, okay, but what about this? What happens if someone's threatening your spouse or your children and the only option you have is to, to kill them? Do you kill? Um, these are issues that Christians have debated for millennia. Pacifism is very ancient in the Christian church. Um, what is it born of? It's born of commands like this. So we've got to figure out how do we take those absolutes and put them into action. Now, this... Um, the interesting thing is when you move from your absolutes to your personals and your theological to your practical and your timeless to your temporal expression, it's uncanny how many differences we do get without someone saying, who cares about the command or I don't really believe in Jesus anyhow. Uh, those are the things that are relatively easy actually because you say you're stepping outside of the Christian faith and you have good reasons for claiming that. If you don't believe in the deity of Christ, that's one of our confessional beliefs, right? Uh, but translating that into action, we get an uncanny amount of difference. And the question is, how do we get that way? So let me take you to a quick trip to my backyard, um, my back patio. And we did a thing at the Biola. Tim and I hosted a thing we called duologues. So we did three or four of these over the course of uh, the, the, yeah, it was a few years ago we were doing them where we took faculty members, faculty in good standing, who had different views on controversial issues. And we had a conversation. We called it a duologue. We did it publicly in an open setting, and we said, okay, let's go back and forth about why we, we view this. The thing we did beforehand was get the participants together for a meal and a long conversation on our back patio. And really what we tended to do was say, okay, tell us the backstory of your conviction. Uh, one of the ones I remember in particular was we had a conversation about why I'm a Christian conservative and why I'm a Christian progressive. And we had two faculty members who were talking about that. Um, interesting conversation. So you're on the back patio and the uh, woman who was the Christian progressive, we said, so you know, tell me a story about this. And says, well... I grew up in a very conservative home and I shared very conservative convictions about political stuff. Uh, that was where this particular thing was framed. And she said, um, and it was probably an upper middle class home. My dad uh, owned a couple of businesses that had started. They were doing pretty well. And so we were, we were pretty well off. And when I was in junior high, 
Uh, my dad, who was an elder in the church, we were very much church-going family and all this, my dad uh, ran off with a church secretary and basically abandoned myself, my sister, and my mom. My mom had always been a good Christian woman who stayed at home and raised her own kids and didn't have an outside-the-house uh, job. And she said, we went from being very comfortable and, like I say, middle-class, upper-middle-class-ish, uh, to literally not knowing where our next meal would come from. And she said, if it weren't for the welfare system and child support things, my dad did not give us child support. And if it weren't for governmental aid, I would have been living in our car if we could have kept our car. So I was really grateful for that. And then she told a story that was, you know, fast forward a few years, she and her husband are you know, married, they uh, are working somewhere. They both lost their jobs or in job transition and then suddenly she discovered she was pregnant. And she said, if there wasn't the Affordable Care Act, I don't know what I would have done for health insurance. And if you ask me why I'm sympathetic to the progressive side, I'm not sure what to say, but I presume I've been shaped by those kinds of experiences. Now, let me make an observation about that. Notice that she hasn't given you an argument that says, therefore, your conservatism is wrong. She is giving an argument for why she finds the progressive world attractive and why she feels it does things. And notice what she said. She said, well, it gives women the permission to do abortions or something. And she said that I love the progressive movement because it does those things. She says, no. Those are actually things. And she, she was pro-life and she disagreed with the, the Democratic Party on that count. But she realized there were other issues that were included in that too. Um, and so the interesting thing that you discover when you do this is it's what I call the black box of conviction making. <laughs> and the input, black box is things where you get an input, something happens in the black box, and then you get an output. What happened in the black box? Usually we have no idea. That's the problem. That's what we call the black box. So here's the black box of conviction making for Christians. We all put the same stuff in. We put our biblical convictions, we put our commandments and things like that. Those are the things that we all share in common. They all go into the black box. Out the other side comes crazy things like one person's in favor of uh, you know, progressive voting, the other conservative voting. We did another one of these on, on uh, money and wealth and one person was capitalist. Another one of our faculty members comes from Canada. He says, guys, I don't know how to say this to you in public. She said this in public, it was a great moment. He says, Canadians, think they're all socialists. Our parties use the name socialist. Wow. Now, of course, their socialism is exactly what we always think about when we hear that word. Um, but you're suddenly like, that is a big difference. And if you've ever had this experience talking to European Christians, you'll realize our political world and their political world are radically different. Our faith is radically the same. I love reading guys like John Stott and uh, you know, C.S. Lewis, you know, all kinds of people who are British evangelicals. Their political think thinking is really, really different than ours. Are they not Christians because of that? No. Something's going on in their black box. <laughs> so their convictions may come out different than our convictions. Now, of course, in a room this size, I'm sure we have a mix of people who would share those convictions and differ from them. But what I want to do is take a moment to unpack what goes on in that black box. So you have these absolutes. You have these action-guiding personal convictions over here. How do these things translate? Well, basically what happens is you have a whole set of things in your heart. I'll call them for a shorthand, core values. Um, but I mean a lot more than just values. I would include in that your core values, but also your personal life experiences, your passions, your fears, your place of origin, a whole set of things like that that shape kind of a disposition of your heart. And here's the thing that I've discovered. Among Christians, we almost always share core values. And in fact, it's uncanny how much core values are actually shared even in the non-Christian world. 
uh, there's about, depending on who you read, there's either six or ten basically universal human values. Well, how do you end up fighting so much? Here's the trick is that we rarely disagree about our values. We disagree about how we rank order them. So when we had our conversation, the Christian progressive and the Christian conservative, it was almost comical how completely they shared a list of values and how differently they rank ordered them. You might wonder how this works. Here's a really simple one. Um, How many of you value truth? Good. How many of you value love? How many of you value truth more than love? How many value love more than truth? I tell you what, if we pressed, I bet I'd split this congregation about 50-50 on that one issue. Viscerally, in your heart, most of us rank order one or the other above the opposite. All of us, I hope all of us, value both, right? But we will rank order those values differently, and then you're confronted with a situation where truth and love are both in play. And the one person will quickly favor love in the conviction they form. The other person will quickly favor truth. Now, what happens if the only thing you ever do when you're talking about convictions is share your conclusion? Thumbs up on the Affordable Care Act. Thumbs down on the Affordable Care Act. Thumbs up on, uh, you know, military intervention in the Ukraine. Thumbs down on any military intervention at all. If all you share is your final conclusion, you're playing what I call convictional whack-a-mole. You pop up your conversion conclusion, the conviction that you have, the other person disagrees with it, and they whack it. And then you're, well, what do you think? And they pop theirs up and you whack them and you have a great time whacking each other's convictions. What's really fun is to say, wait a minute, let me play this game differently. And say, tell me the story of your conviction. When did you first start thinking that way? And that's what we did on my back patio. And it was a whole revelation to hear the story of a person's convictions. And actually, one of my favorite times that I had was when he had five different people talking about this issue about Christian views of wealth and economics. And we had a lot of different viewpoints. And we ended up hearing stories about people who had the most incredible, just one person almost died in a car accident, all kinds of things where God dramatically intervened in people's lives. And one of the weird side effects, we we had lived and worked together at Biola for years, but many of us had never heard those stories about another person. And once you hear the story, two things happen. Number one is you realize how deep their faith is. Number two, you realize, I've never had that experience, and no wonder they see things differently. No wonder they see things differently. And as I say, this, this doesn't solve issues when we're disagreeing about the deity of Christ and other confessional beliefs or throwing out Ten Commandments or whatever. But most of our battles these days, we've been fighting over to vaccinate or not vaccinate, to close a border, uh, to build a wall, or to open the border. Um, we've been fighting about, you know, public school waivers, and, we, you know, we fight about a whole batch of things. I'm saying, guys, mask mandates aren't on the list of confessional belief. You know, when was the last time you had a creedal statement that said, we believe that we should all wear a mask? We believe that no one should get a vaccine. Um, and yet those are the things we rip and bite and tear at each other on. Um, even in, well, so that's the tension. And one of the things that becomes kind of magical for easing that tension is just to take that deep breath and say, tell me the story of your conviction. Now back to my issue about half-cooked convictions is oftentimes we're not even self-aware of our own story. Why do I feel that way? Why do I think this? And suddenly you realize, oh, this is something my mom and dad always did. This is something that I grew up with. And we aren't even cognizant of that in particular, just as part of our background thinking. So it's enormously helpful for us when we're thinking about our convictions to not just say, here's what I feel. 
we don't always, we usually don't actually come to a, a moral conviction by a careful process of reasoning. We have moral intuitions. Sometimes they're well-formed, sometimes they're poorly formed, but by and large, the way we come to a conviction first is by that kind of a moral intuition. We think, yeah, thumbs up, thumbs down. We taste of the act with our conscience and say, no, that's not something that should happen. And then we tend to reason backward. We find to find reasons for our conviction. Now, some people will tell you that's a terrible thing. You should always start at the beginning and work your way to the end. I'm like, I don't think that's that. I, I think we do all kinds of things. My concern isn't the order in which you do it. My concern is that you do the whole thing. That if you have a really clear action kind of conviction over here, that you say, let me think through why that's actually grounded in Scripture. Let me think through how that might attach to biblical teaching. Let me think about where that comes from my own heart. And then you end up with what I call a well-cooked conviction, or at least a partly cooked conviction that can stand just a little bit more cooking. And you might ask, how do you then cook a conviction? You know the way you cook a conviction? Is you share it with someone. And the best cookers are usually people who might disagree with you a little bit. And, and you just say, you know what? I'd like my conviction to be well-formed and well-cooked. So let me, let me run it out. Let me talk to people a little bit. And if you can get gracious people to talk back and forth, it's uncanny how much better formed your convictions become without necessarily changing frequently. In fact, I've done a lot of this. I'm not a guy who's really changed my convictions very much in my adult life. Maybe I'm boring, but it's true. But boy, have I gotten a lot more good reasons and thinking, and I've also learned some nuances and limitations on my convictions that I never knew were there. How? By sharing them. Um, so that's the, the big goal that I would say. What I have here, we can't read these very well. Let me do this. Are you guys all familiar with uh, critical race theory, CRT? Um, I'm just, what I'd like to do as an illustration of this at the end is walk through three different convictions a person might have about critical race theory. And I just want you to show you how this progression works. It's an illustration that I want to get through, not an argument for any one of these three positions. Now, the number one thing I want to say about a thing like critical race theory, if you're forming a conviction on it, don't form a conviction on critical race theory. Why? Because we don't even know what it means usually. And once you discover what it means, it, it's meaning about 12 different things. So pick something specific about this. And in this case, I'm saying, let's talk about systemic racism or institutionalized racism. That is one thing that comes up. We have microaggressions. We have all kinds of other things that get swirled up in this conference. I'm saying, just tackle them one at a time. So this one's going to be about what do we do with a thing like notions of systemic racism? Should we talk about it? Do we believe in this as Christians? So here's conviction number one. They're going to start with their confessional beliefs. Romans 5.12, sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. So death spread because all sinned, i.e., they weren't guilty of systemic sin. He's saying they all sinned individually. They personally sinned, right? Um, and they, Paul goes on to describe in Romans 6, we are enslaved to sin, and that happens at a personal level. You have become slaves to sin. Or you can convert to just become a slave to righteousness. But the point is, this is a, a state of property you're in as an individual person. It's not a systemic thing. It's a personal thing. Moral mandates, well, we're to repent and confess our sins, um, we're not to lie and say we don't have any sins. These, again, are personal level commands that are given us in terms of how we deal with sin. Um, and then Ezekiel 18 is really big passage on this. God does not hold us responsible for the sins of others. He says, what's this proverb I hear you saying that the, the um, father has eaten sour grapes and the son's teeth are set on edge? He says, that's a bunch of malarkey. God holds the father responsible for the father's sins and the son responsible for the son's sins. Don't give me this stuff that says, and by the way, Ezekiel goes on to say, 
By the way, the same works with righteousness. I don't care how righteous your dad was. If you're not righteous, it doesn't, it's not working for you. You answer for yourself. So you see that current going on in, in Scripture there. Core values, well, perhaps one here is personal responsibility. Never judge others by the sins of their forefathers. That's just not a thing that you do. Give everybody a fresh start. Um, social structures matter, but real change is always from the inside out and from the bottom up not from the outside in and the top down. And I hear people saying that a lot. That's one of those phrases that some people latch on to and, and repeat, and I think that there's a lot of reason to say that. So in light of that, the conduct guiding convictions, we shouldn't talk about systemic sin or institutionalized racism. Such talk falsely blames people for the sins of other. Sins are personal, not institutional or systemic. Now, my own question is, does that make sense? The logic of what they did, you not whether or not you agree, but do you see how that reasoning went? We're telling the story of a conviction here. Okay, I see nods, so that's good. Let me tell you another story. Sin is not just individual acts. This is conviction number two. Sin is not just individual acts. The world, the monolic principalities and powers and authorities that oppose God, and that God triumphs over on the cross. This language is all taken from the Bible, and these are things, these entities are living out there, and they are embodiments of sin. They aren't individuals. They're principalities, powers, and authorities. These are things that are not individual people. Uh, human institutions are also the work of human hands, and therefore they're tainted sin. All your righteous deeds are like filthy rags. What did you do? I built an institution. Guess what? I bet it's like a filthy rag. Why? Because you built it and you're a sinner. You and your buddies built it. Great. Do you think it got better because you got eight sinners together instead of just one? Your institutions are going to be marked by sin. Why would you think otherwise if they're made by human beings? Moral mandates. Notice, it's great to say you should confess individually, but do you know that Daniel took a long time to confess the sins of the national and to confess the national and historic sins of the nation of Israel when he's uh, having these interactions in Babylon. Um, repentance can also mean changing. So sin and repenting of sin includes changing the problem, changing systems and structures that we have built, oppressive legal systems, false-hearted corporate worship, things like that. Read the book of Amos. There's a whole batch of those things about how justice is or is not being done that are to be repented of and changed because they're sinful. But they're built into the justice system that is not being just in Israel at that time. Core values here, we're members of a body and parts of a community for which we are responsible. We can't say, hey, I didn't do that. I didn't say, not my fault. If it continues to do bad, how do you leave it? The longer you leave it, the more you're tacitly approving it. You're part of a community. Own the truths about your community. Uh, true repentance involves turning away from future sin, but it also calls restitution for past sins, right? We don't just say, I won't, I won't cheat you anymore. Zacchaeus runs out and pays back the people he's cheated already. You do, you do restitution for sins you've committed. So in light of that, sin is sometimes embedded in human institutions, and we are as responsible for systemic sin as we are for personal and private sin. It isn't that there's no such thing as private sin, just that there's both. And we're responsible for both, and we can't wash our hands of either. We, we need to deal with it. That's conviction number two. Conviction number three. We're all created in the image of God, and in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, barbarian, Scythian, all those kinds of things. These are important biblical truths, the, the commonness of humanity. Moral mandates, we're to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. We're to weep with those who weep. We are to show no favoritism. These are all explicit biblical commands for how we conduct ourselves, right? Core values, churches should be havens of unity, respect, and mutual support. We should care tangibly for others within the body and within the world at large. The church doesn't look to social institutions for its guide. We should intentionally not conform to the world's institution. We should be doing, in effect, our own thing. We aren't conformed to this world, but we're being transformed. We do things differently. 
And therefore, analyzing CRT keeps us from more important issues. We avoid caring about the real hurts and the real people because we're worried about the abstract battles over CRT or systemic racism or microaggressions or whatever it is. And it's like, yeah, but what about John who's sitting in front of you and has just been, you know, badly treated by whatever it is that might, might have been going on? Um, we, it keeps us from empathizing with brothers and sisters who are suffering. And it keeps us from changing things within the church itself. Acts chapter 6 is a great example of this. Uh, they're doing a bad job caring for the poor widows. Um, and notice what the apostles do. They organize and institutionalize a solution to it. The apostles says, we want to keep preaching and praying. It's wrong for us to lose that. But we need to solve this problem. So we're going to organize a batch of deacons who are going to take care of it. It's really interesting. Who's getting cheated in this? the Hellenistic Jews. Who do they appoint as deacons? Seven people with Greek names. You think that's an accident? Really interesting. So, so you see in the New Testament people saying, okay, we need, we need to fix these things. And they're not fixing Rome. <laughs> they're fixing the church. But they're saying, this, this is our problem. We, we better fix it. So, there you go. Three Christian convictions with their backstories. Now, here's my hope. Number one, I hope that you found one of those three convictions that might somewhere drift around where you feel comfortable. Number two, my hope would be that you learn something about the other two convictions by hearing the story of that conviction. And number three, my hope would be that if you were talking to another person, it would make it easier to understand, love, and listen to them if you heard the whole story of the conviction instead of getting whack-a-mole on the conviction. Does that all make sense? So that's my long story here about the value of thinking and understanding our convictions more deeply. It makes our own convictions better, it makes it easier to share, and it makes us more likely to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, because we can talk to each other across our differences. So there you have it. Let me end with that. Dale, you are going to be our moderator here for Q&A and all that kind of stuff, and we still have uh, hopefully 20 yeah. minutes left. We got to thank Dr. Langer for sharing with us. We have uh, a few minutes if you have any questions that you want to ask. Some of you might go, huh, what question do I ask? Anybody have a question? An idea, yes. We got a mic for you. First of all, thank you very much for being here. I think all of us got a lot of your talk out of your talk. One question is, how do we relate to family? Uh, I have a brother that I had to unfriend on Facebook because his ideas are so radical that mine. We love each other. We talk about everything other than religion and politics. Are we, am I doing the right thing? Because he knows where I stand. I know where he stands. But there's certain things we don't talk about. Am I doing the right thing? Yeah. So, number one, in case you were wondering, you have so much company on that issue right now. I mean, it's, it's sad to me, but it's, it's really true. And I, I just, the last time I was giving one of these talks, I, someone came up to me and said, well, I'm in a mixed marriage. And I didn't know exactly what they meant until they explained my husband's a Democrat and I'm a Republican. And uh, it's been really tense. Um, and so, yeah, what about unfriending? Here's one of the things I would say. This, this, so this is one of those areas, I don't think there's simple right and wrong answers. Let me just throw a little bit of, of you know, my, my own perspective about that. I don't think that that is necessarily problematic. The one thing I would do if I did that, though, would be to call your brother up and say, hey, John, I just want to tell you, I, I love you as my brother, and we have had, we've had a long run together that I treasure and will always treasure. 
Right now, uh, things on Facebook, whatever, are making it really hard to do it. And I find when I read things, I end up thinking thoughts about you that I don't want to think. And I'm not saying that's your fault. I'm thinking those thoughts, right? I, I am the one who's in charge of my own mind, but I think I would be better and be able to love you better if I went ahead and just unfriended your Facebook feed. And I want you to know that means, that does not mean I'm not wanting to be your friend or your brother anymore, but I'm having a harder time doing that well the more I read about that. And that's me, not you, but that's a thing. So here's what I'm thinking. So part of this is just always remembering on the other end is not an abstract position, but a living person. And if you want to preserve those relationships intact, it's amazing what you can get away with if you're just up front and say, I don't know what to do but this, and here's what I'm thinking of doing. And that gives him a shot to say something back, like I get it, or say, you know what, maybe I could tone it down. There's no telling what might happen. But I wouldn't just do it and let him sit there and wonder, what's, what's he thinking? What's he thinking? He must be really mad at me. Because that's the part that really makes it hard. Yeah. And by the way, if others have bright ideas on this, I, I am not the final source of all wisdom on things like this. So Tim, my, my friend Tim, I wish Tim were here because he and his brother are exactly in that position. And they have refused, they've chosen to refuse to talk about certain things. Tim's like, he's the vocational winsome conviction dude. He writes the books with me. And uh, yeah, he's not talking to his brother about this stuff. Um, and, and part of it is when you do that right, you're actually still preserving unity. In fact, part of why you hit those boundaries is exactly to do that, because you're saying, I'm going to a place I don't want to go. It's really yeah. good. Yeah, somebody over yeah. there. Yep. Hey, you may need it for others. What, what are some ways to move highly charged, tense interactions to a place where even if the other person doesn't know the strategies, doesn't know how to seek your full story, that you can bring them into a place that kind of diffuses that a bit? Yeah. So here's a mental image for you. For certain, wait, this isn't the ideal, but you know sometimes you're moving in situations that aren't the ideal, and that's what I hear you kind of describing. It's not a bad thing to kind of mentally picture you picking up the little box that your convictions are in and walking it over here and just dropping it into the uh, trash compactor and saying, my convictions won't be on the table today. I'm going to take my time and give the other person the gift of, of listening. Um, that sounds a little better than it feels, because I've done this, and you keep hoping that halfway through the conversation, I'll stop saying, well, what do you think? And you get to say, I'm so glad you asked. And the bottom line is, people will get their momentum up and never look back. And specific questions that you might Yeah, so there, there really are, and one of them is say, well, here, here's the thing, I actually say this a lot, is now, I have never thought about the, that issue this way. And that really surprises me. Could you tell me a little bit more about why you think that way? And that gives them an interesting reminder that you see things differently, but you're also looking at them face to face. Because on Facebook, you can just flame because, hey, the person isn't there. It's crazy what we would do on Facebook that we would never do in person. When person realizes, oh, this person kind of disagrees, usually they de-escalate some and, and calm down a little bit. But any way you can show curiosity, don't shy away from saying you might see it differently or about, boy, I've never thought about it that way. Um, and one other freebie here, sometimes people ask you a question that's like really good and you don't have an answer to that. A really good thing to say is, you know what I like about you? is you make me think better. I'm going to have to do a little thinking and get back to you on that one because that's a stumper. Um, you're not God. Well, here's one of our problems. We think we're supposed to be, well, we are commanded to be witnesses for Jesus. And for some reason, we think we're supposed to be his attorney. So a witness just says, the witness is the blind man in John chapter 9. It's like, why do you keep asking me these questions? I used to be blind, and now I see. End of story. Sue me. I, I mean, that's the story. I don't know what else to say. He's the witness. 
And he's not forming that into the closing statement. He's not having to win the argument. He's just saying, here's my experience. And so it's really good to stop and say, you know what? I am not the ultimate defender of this. Let me just be the, the witness. Um, and that helps you lose some of the tension with that too. You don't always have to have an answer. And you don't always even have to get your arguments in because you realize in some cases this person isn't listening. And if I turn up the volume, they won't hear it any better. So you take a deep breath and you let it go. But I am so talking like this is, hey, easy problem. It doesn't feel like an easy problem most of the time when you're actually doing it. Is that helpful? Back there then, Dean. Thank you very much for sharing. This is really super helpful. So I'm thinking, I'm very practical in my thinking. So at the end of all this, you have a relationship You've listened to a person. They know that you're a good listener. What's the next step? Um, is it you let the Holy Spirit work on that person, hoping that they'll come to the Lord? Or do you have specific things that can bring the conversation to something that is more uh, meaty, that will lead to the, the gospel, for instance? Yeah, so I, I think that really depends an awful lot about the people and the circumstances. So I've had conversations like this that are kind of a bit one-off, and you realize it probably won't go anywhere. Uh, another thing I did, we had some people who had different views about social justice. At, this is some fellow professors at Biola. And uh, I gave a short talk about this, was talking to a guy afterwards, and we got this bright day. Why don't we get some people together who disagree about this and just say, look, Let's spend some time having a little reading group where we read each other's literature and talk about what we've read. You bring some of your stuff, we'll bring some, and we will go back and forth. That group met for two and a half years. Um, nobody changed their opinions. I did learn a lot from that group. It was not my happiest memory, um, being honest. But it was one of the more valuable things I did. So you can do things that kind of dive in and say, hey, let's, let's look at this. Let's, uh, you know, read some things in common. Um, I just was doing, I was chatting with Dale about this right before I, I got here. We, I was, I'm part of a small group that ha takes place on Zoom with people across the country who have really different opinions. The thing we did today was an exercise called Lay on the Line. And so they would ask a question like, America has not adequately dealt with its legacy of slavery. And you need to strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, or strongly disagree. And there's a little piece of software that they have that you just, you know, boom, that comes. You've got your smartphone there. You type it in. Your little dot goes there. It's all anonymous. But then you take time to talk about, okay, who was, in, who was on the strongly agree side Talk a little bit about that. All right, let's hear from someone who strongly disagree. And a little bit of structure goes an amazingly long way to making what would otherwise be a toxic conversation relatively healthy. But I'm a huge fan of giving that little bit of structure because if you just say, hey, let's talk about this, it rarely goes well. So you want to say, we're going to go back and forth reading each other's stuff. We're going to have this kind of a thing that you hear from one, hear from the other. I've done a whole bunch of moderating kind of things that, that foster this. But you can do more directly addressing of it if you have the people and the will. But if you do that, pick up, pick up a structure to help you do it. We had a really fun thing called, uh, can't we just talk about it, the previous election cycle where I got about 20 faculty volunteered for this. I took statements from the Democratic platform and the Republican platform, and I had people rank order their agreements like that, and we chose the four issues we most completely disagreed about. And we uh, spent the semester having, we'd talk about one of each time with a different type of structure. And I put, out, I put some of this in a paper, so if you want some of that, I'd be happy to send you a copy of that that paper because it, it describes some of those processes. Yeah, one more. Me. Thank you, Dr. Linker. So those three examples were interesting because they gave conflicting, it seemed like they were conflicting, you know, views of 
of historically how we have have used racism and yet we're not responsible the second one was we're not responsible personally you know or from our ancestors and you know when when i thought about those you know those can coexist with me even though they seem opposing i can i can accept those different points of view now when my black box makes a decision on how do I make a decision when I have to take a stand? I kind of, I think my subconscious crunches it all, but then the thing I have to do is turn it over to God and say, you know, dear God, help me with this. And then hopefully I'm going to hear something or feel something or, or know something, or I'm going to hear other people that are, or, or scripture that are going to help me work, work it out. You know, but, but even then, lately when I do that, God says, hey, don't be looking at, don't be asking me questions. You're not going to like the answers because <laughs> you're going to have to look at yourself. And now I'm going to show you the areas I want you to change in your life. You know, the areas of sin. Take care of that first before you ask me those, those big questions. So it's kind of a interesting, I think it's a process. But yeah. it's interesting the, ways, the way you've presented that. And thank you for that. And I appreciate you pointing that out. And just to underscore this, notice that all of those began with biblical content that I think were all basically accurately exegeted. I mean, we can fine tune all of that, but the point is they were just saying there's more than one verse in the Bible that might apply to this particular thing you're thinking about. And this is one of the worst things we do is think there's only one verse that answers this whole question. And by and large, there's a set of verses. Sometimes there's whole narratives about things. You know, which verse do you want to choose about how do you deal with the poor? Wow, there's a lot to choose from. And sometimes those things do conflict because it's a different situation or a different context. Yeah. Different and you have to go through the process trying to sort that out. Yeah, and the, these are the things. If you do a little bit of this, show your work on your conviction, it's really helpful for developing a little bit of modesty. And humility about your convictions. You suddenly realize, oh, this wasn't. I, I did this with a batch of people who were all gung ho pro life, and they are. It's like 125 people in the room, and they had about 10 different tables. They were working on by table, and this one table just is full of pro life people. And said, go ahead, do do your conviction map on pro life stuff. I, I come walking around the room about 10 minutes later and say, so how are you guys doing? I said, this is way harder than I thought. And these folks were all absolutely, you know, flamingly committed to this, but they realized, I haven't really thought through this whole process. And it does create a little bit more softness when you realize it isn't easy to show your work all the time. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Anger, for being with us. He said he'd be here for a few minutes afterwards if you want to come up and ask him a question specifically. But thank you so much for coming out um, on a Wednesday night. We appreciate it. I hope you appreciated what... There's this opportunity, and that's the kinds of things that we want to do when we're able to. So let me just close us with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for Dr. Langer and his family and the, the many, many years of just ministry. Thank you for the things you've taught him that he now can teach others. Uh, we appreciate that. We're blessed by that. Father, may we be people that are quick to hear and slow to speak the posture of curiosity, the posture of love, the posture of truth, all of it, but with the understanding of engaging and loving well. So just thank you for this night, and uh, just ask that you continue to work in our hearts. In your name, amen. God bless you all.